Welcome to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast, the podcast where we learn from cybersecurity experts how to stay safe, private, and secure on the cloud and in code. CSCP is hosted by Francesco Cipollone, your cybersecurity friend with a passion for all things cyber and sharing stories of other professionals with you. This episode is brought to you by the generosity of Phoenix Security Limited. Phoenix helps startups and enterprises solve complex software security supply chain visibility by leveraging the power of correlation and contextualization. Discover how Phoenix Security helps CISO and security engineers act fast, prevent burnout, and implement DevSecOps at the speed of cloud. Phoenix Security. Correlate, contextualize, and act on risk with one click. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. Today, we have a returning guest and one of my favorite guests because we discuss a lot of very interesting things. And after a few years, we're coming back on the podcast discussing even more interesting things. So I have on the show Caleb Sima uh, that has been a pioneering in a lot of Think Cyber and has been the CISO of Robinhood, CISO of Databricks, or actually VP of Security of Databricks. He's been a founder of his own startup and now is coming here on the podcast to discuss quite interesting things. But before diving in, Caleb, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, glad to be back. My history, I, I consider myself an old man in cybersecurity, you know, started in the 90s, I think that ages myself pretty pretty well. But you know, I started out as a as a reverse engineer and a pen tester, and then started my first company. You know, way back in the day, that you know, I could I can now say really pioneered the AppSec space and created the first dynamic black box scanner called WebInspect. I was the CTO and founder of this company called Spot Dynamics. Then from there, I did quite a few others. It was acquired by HP. I did a couple other startups. Uh, I also became a VC for a year at Andreessen Horowitz for a little while, mm-hmm. worked on another startup uh, that also got acquired. And then you know, I decided to do this unusual pivot in my career where I went from like being a CEO and founder to you know just a middle manager in a security team at Capital One. And a lot of people, they ask me about that. They're like, why in the world did you do this? Um, how you went from like CEO and founder, like went backwards. Most people go the opposite way. They like right. go to become CEO and founders. And I did it for a very specific reason. I really wanted, you know, I love, I've been security my entire career, but I've never defended an organization. And I think that going out in the field of battle is really critical to understanding what really happens and. And so I went to Capital One, did that, then went to Databricks and built the security team there, and then went to Robinhood and then built the security team there. And so that is where I just left just a few months ago at Robinhood and I'm now on to new ventures. So that's a little bit of my background and a summary. Brilliant. And in all these experiences, and especially in the recent experience, have you seen the world of cyber changing, especially on how we build things. And like there's been a lot of noise and revolution, a lot of movement, but nothing consolidated. So if I'm a new starter in the field of application security or cloud security, if I'm a builder and I, and I build it securely, what, what advice would you give to somebody kind of entering in this world that is very dynamic right now of security where all folks, I, I consider myself a little bit older and that are used to traditional security and defender security and and how how has the world changed or is changing i think that kind of drives into this uh word of sort of security you know i there's your question actually has multiple levels of answers so i'm trying to uh so first i think there's a let me ask you i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a refining question just so i can i can get this okay your, your question to me says on the surface right off is hey what advice would i give to new people entering 
to the cybersecurity space and and what would my advice to them be? Mm -hmm. Or are you talking about just the overall meaning of security and and thoughts around that? Where would you like me to sort of let, let's start let's start with the newcomer and then we can move on the bigger okay. picture of like how security uh, is changing or or has changed dramatically in the last year or so. Perfect. You know, one thing I think that is really critical that I tell all newcomers is focus on things. <laughs> this is kind of funny because one, I say focus on things that are not security related. In fact, when anyone says, hey, I would like to mentor and I want to get into cybersecurity, uh, the number one thing I see is, do you know the fundamentals? Like, mm -hmm. do you understand how networking works? Do you understand how programming and engineering work? Do you under understand how a CPU works, right? So I think like there's a lot of that that needs to be good basis foundations. And so that's the first thing you've got to really understand. And I also, you you need to go learn how to code. And it doesn't, like some people get wrapped up around programming languages and which language to pick. It doesn't matter, pick Python and then just go, right? Once you know one, you can figure out the others. Second to that, then it says, okay, now that you've got your foundations, what do you pick? And the way that I, I, I always encourage people to do this is always start with offense. So when yeah. you think about what you want to do, be a hacker, learn offense, learn pen testing, go do bug bounties, go learn on the offensive side of the house. I think it's absolutely critical that you know this because- the entire industry and the only reason why we exist is because there are attackers. And I think a lot of times actually in teams, we lose sight of the fact that our real goal isn't compliance, regulation, and policies. It's actually defending it against an attacker. <laughs> and so you need to understand the attacker. You need to understand the mindset. And we just get like, you know, in a security team, we get layered and layered and layered. And Sometimes some of you are sitting in meetings and talking about like these, like, oh, least privileges and some firewalls and apps and app sec. And, and then you just like, well, where's the attack, right? Like, what is the attack that we are actually defending against? And, and you just right. lose that sight. And so that's the first thing I tell people is go do that six months minimum, right? And then from there, I think you can start making a decision. And then my next advice is always, Hey, the best thing for you to do is to focus on something. Pick something that you feel after you've done your offense, pick something that you feel, you know, you uh, more find yourself a natural at, you know, whether it's be forensics, just detection and response, security, engineering, cloud, whatever it happens to be, go pick it, find the topic, focus on it and be very good at that as a niche and then grow from there. No, that's great. And I think... It's an interesting approach. Don't you find that like starting in offense and then pivoting in defense, you might get biased with the view. So I, I like your angle that says like it gives you a good foundation and a good hook to think when you're in a meeting, when you're defending, like go back to the basics, think basics. And some people remain pen testing. <laughs> I guess. Hey, which, which, by the way, is phenomenal, right? Then, then they've now found their chosen area and they're running with it. No, but I, li I like also your aspect of from uh, from attacker to defender because we have a lot of pen testing and, and the noise in the industry saying, okay, the pen test find the vulnerability, but it doesn't contextualize from a business perspective. It doesn't give the so what. It doesn't give how I can fix it or why should I fix it, that specific vulnerability. So it create that level of empathy. Yeah. It's just that, you know, I found so many times that we, we can tend to lose sight. I think the wording that you said is spot on, which is if you understand the offense, it allows you to get to the fundamental root problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And many times you lose sight, like you, especially at certain levels where it's like, Hey, what we need is we need a policy and a compliance rule about X. And you're like, well, why do we need that? <laughs> right. And then the question goes down well, because we have to have the proper protections in place on this, this, these types of controls. Well, why do we need these controls? Well, these controls are put in place in order to ensure that this kind of issue doesn't reveal itself. Well, what kind of issue is that? Well, it generally stems from some attack somewhere that an attacker can use in order to get what you need. And so really everything revolves around that, whether it's about 
understanding the attack, understanding the impacts of the attack, being able to audit the attack, being able to have tracing of all of that attack, being able to do forensics on that attack, like recovering from it. Everything mm-hmm. sort of starts revolving around that, but it gets so layered up that if you don't understand the real on the ground, why are we defending? What are the actual attacks? You can lose sight of what fundamentally is true. And I think that in an, in an organization, you are dealing with 50 things every day, right? And yeah. so how do you prioritize, right? Prioritization is really, really key. And prioritizing is about managing risk. Well, if you don't know what the risk is based off of what the attack could potentially be, then how do you, you understand how to prioritize? No, I really like you going back to the to the basic, to the the why we're defending that sometimes in big organization you get lost in, as you mentioned, compliance or tick box exercises or just doing that because somebody said that is the direction and approach. I think going back to the basics enabled you to go back to the hook and the why. Yeah, like and... let me give you just a short example on this. Like if you say, hey, we really want to defend our organization on the highest highest risks based on where we are, what our threat model, what we've defined as our highest risk, and you build the proper foundations and controls in order to do good security in that, in that fashion, policies, compliance, and regulation just follow. Right. (laughs) All they are doing is just checking to validate and make sure that you've done what is good security and that it relies on good foundations, good, good risk management around the threats that are true to your organization. And you mentioned a couple of words that is security and safety and and you move between these two words. Are are they the same word that they they have the same meaning for you or yeah, I've actually uh it's a great it's a great pickup because I've actually had this thing in mind where even at my last organization I started moving towards this I want to move from security to safety. You know, I've even gotten to the extreme of thinking about naming my team from a security team to a safety team with yellow and, jackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and here's and here's why, right? Like, let me give you uh, the simple analogy that I'm I, I sh- I'm sure you hear a lot about, sort of in a car. Like you've ever heard the car analogy, right? Which is, mm-hmm. hey, like, do you realize when you get in a car and you drive to a restaurant and drive back, you are in effect doing a very dangerous thing, right? Getting on a car, co- getting in a car and going on the roads is really dangerous. Your risks, the odds, like you know, drivers who don't know what they're doing, like getting in an accident, hitting the wrong things. There's so many variables. It in fact is a dangerous process. But when you get in a car and go somewhere, you never think of it as being dangerous. Mm. In fact, it feels safe to you, right? And why does it feel safe? It feels safe because actually built into that car, it's not just the seat belts that keep you there, but it's also things like, you know, anti-lock brakes, traction control, like all of these different kinds of safety mechanisms that are built into this vehicle to help you do what you need to do, which is get from point A to point B safely. And the the purpose is that your objective is to get to the restaurant and eat and come home. But the car, the vehicle that's produced in order to do that includes all the things you need to make sure your family is safe, you're safe. All of those things are put in place so that you are kept in a great place and feel good doing it and can do this safely. And the problem is, I think, in an organization, we don't think that way. What, the way we think about it today from an analogy in my perspective is like if you get in your car and you know it's more like the president of the United States, where you've got like four cars in front, four cars behind, <laughs> scouts and snipers on roofs, you know, like, so basically every time every employee wants to go do something, you have to expend all this effort to find attackers, defend attackers, look for where they are, respond to them. Like you are, you're putting all this surrounding thing. This is what I think security is, right? <laughs> Versus safety is getting in the car and just doing what you need to do and doing it safely. And, and in a very similar analogy is like an iPhone right? When mm-hmm. you use an iPhone, you know, it's such an amazing device because you can do productive corporate work on it. 
you can watch dumb YouTube videos or you can listen to amazing podcasts, right? And the thing <laughs> right, about right. it is, you know, you do all of those things without thinking and security doesn't get in your way while doing it. But in fact, an iPhone is an extraordinarily secure device, right? And it's so secure, right. but in order for them to do that, it's the same as the car. You have to build and integrate security at every layer of the stack, right? Mm. And when you as a user just use it to do what you want, an iPhone feels safe because privacy, because of the built-in security that's there, because of the usability. It takes you, all it does is take you on your journey to what you need to do, and you can do it in a great way. And I think that when I think about safety, I think about that privacy. I think about integration. I think about embeddedness. I think about usability, user experience. These are all things when I think about safety. My quote that I kind of tell people is, I want to allow employees to do unsafe things safely, <laughs> right? It's like and seamless security. Like yeah. Security and that is there, but it's quite the quiet watcher, not the sniper on the roof or not the chopper on your car. <laughs> that's <laughs> or on right. on top of your car. That's right. That's great. I think that that goes back to building securely instead of building security into product, but building securely and, and creating those guardrails and those security safety points that even if you get into an accident, you know that you feel safe and you have guardrails and control that enable you to not get injured or if you get injured to minimize that element. Which is very key thing what you said, which is what security teams, you know, when you think about organizations, how much focus does a team focus on the identification detection versus the actual like, hey, response or the mm -hmm. containment? You assume that an accident has occurred. How do you minimize that damage? That There's very little focus there, right? It's because as an industry, we've always been subject to defending rather than building. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. We've been conditioned to the fact that we are the defender of the organization. We're not the builder with the organization. So we, we tend to think still pen testing at the end of a project instead of shifting even earlier before the project is, is conceived with yes. like regulation yeah. and requirements that are out there. So we could use that as a leverage point. And those are business requirements. They're not even security requirements. It's a, it's a good point because if I go back to that analogy, it's like asking the sniper to to build security mechanisms in a car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a couple of sniper friends that might ask them. How, yeah, you know what they're going to do? They're going to say bulletproof <laughs> windows, armored plates, you know. Well, like, that's that's yeah. exactly it. They've been conditioned to think that's security for their world. So if you ask a security professional like us, in, in our old age, we think like I, if I think security, I think, okay, I need this, this, and this, but not to build securely, not to create a, a safe plus radius, but to create something that could detect and react rather than recover. I think yeah. for me, my analogy, my head, that's, that's what I think of re cyber resiliency versus, you know, the security as it stands. So how do yes. we uncondition a generation of people? <laughs> <laughs> without breaking the rights I, that we built. I actually think, you know, you it's obviously you say education, right? And part of it mm -hmm. is educating. But I also think that there is a trend that's happening, right? And the trend is, you know, I, if you look sort of in the last generation, the last generation of sort of security leaders have been either IT-based, legal-based, um, audit-based sort of security mm -hmm. leaders. And what you're seeing as, you know, obviously as the generations evolve is much more technical, much more engineering focused kinds of talent coming up into these ranks. And so I think you, you start seeing that shift occur. So for example, one of the things that, you know, you, you've heard of this software eats the world, right? Sort of yes. analogy <laughs> uh, by, by Mark Andreessen. I have another one in my, my that, that analogy is engineering eats security. <laughs> and like, you know, I, I I truly believe as you, you know, it will never happen completely, but I think a shift is 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 starting to happen where engineers are are growing up in a world where security, resiliency, recovery are all things that are needed, and security and privacy start becoming hot topics. 
And so in infrastructure, in software, you're you're going to you start seeing the focus of that early on and how they build it into their stacks. And I think like that's really the way to solve this problem is that the best way, <laughs> this is really kind of, this is why I say the best way to be more secure is actually to focus it all in the fundamentals, is to do things that are non-security, right? So like, for example, right. if my engineering team had a very clean, great hygiene, you know, dev pipeline process, that would resolve 80% of your security problems, right? That alone, like a good model on how, with great hygiene on how you push to prod and how you go through that, you know, gr good engineering hygiene will solve a ton of cybersecurity issues. And so like when you, the biggest impact you can make in security is doing improvements in non-security things. This episode is brought to you by the generosity of Phoenix Security Limited. Phoenix helps startups and enterprises solve complex software security supply chain visibility by leveraging the power of correlation and contextualization. Phoenix platform connects to your repositories, scanners, and cloud, correlates all the information, and provides you with a prioritized list of vulnerabilities that need to be addressed first. Discover how Phoenix Security helps CISOs and developers remove friction and maximize the use of DevSecOps professionals at phoenix.security. Phoenix Security. Correlate, contextualize, and act on risk with one click. But we come from a generation where security didn't even touch code. Like, as you rightfully said, people from a leadership perspective were legal, were GLC, were compliance. We don't, we, we never had the empathy um, as a community or half of the community to actually understand how those processes work. And sometimes we think, okay, we need to bolt on all this stuff. Well, the answer could be, as you rightfully said, let's just do things right. Because by doing things right, we actually remove the problem entirely. Like instead of fixing the problem, let's remove the even the presence or the possibility that the problem appears. Like what, you what know, I, it's rust? it's it's hard because you know everybody in every security team and in every engineering team knows what the right thing to do is. They actually do. the The issue is they don't have the time capability in order exactly. to do it. That is the problem. Like in every company I've been in, the engineers know what to do. The security team knows what to do. The issue is where is that on the priority list, right? And how long is it going to take? And so, you know, that is the ever loading problem is, you know, there's 50 things to do. Cybersecurity is a very, very small percentage of that. And you have got to figure out how do I get that in there? And by the way, I like engineers, smart engineers, every smart engineer you talk to knows mm -hmm. what's going on with security. And they actually know what's what's more worse about security than you and your security team do, right? Actually, if you go to your engineering team and you say, you ask the simple question, what scares you? They will give you a list of things that none of your auditors, pen testers, red teamers <laughs> have identified. Well, they, they have to... They have the yeah. inside knowledge, right? If they don't know, who else would, right? It, but they and they know that it's a security issue. They're like, I know this list is a problem. It's like I have no capability to fix it, right? Exactly. That's the thing. But isn't isn't a little bit our fault of security as an industry that we've been just jumping shift right, shift left, and I'm using these terms as a broad, but just as an indication of like. We've been trying to talk security to developer and developer to security. Well, we haven't included the real decision making that is the other side of the business, the, the people that decide how many feature does a sprint require. Like Because those are the decision makers that really end up deciding, okay, this is how much security level do I need to bake in? And they operate with risk. Like if I don't produce X amount of feature, I'm not going to go to market. My product is going to fail. And that change on a week to week basis, same as the risk tolerance. So yeah. I guess there is there are two aspects that I'm seeing. And the question is, what is your opinion about it on building guard rate and building security versus building securely continuously? I think, you know, again, I, I you know, I'm a little less negative. I I I see a little bit of, you know, silver lining. I feel like as technologies are evolving, as things are being built into 
Like, for example, if you just look at AWS, Microsoft and Azure, GCP, you know, they are starting to really build in security mm -hmm. items, analysis, products, tools into these frameworks and foundations so that it becomes a quality foundation. It's slow going and it doesn't mean it solves everything. But let me also give you, we have to talk about ML and AI since that's what everybody talks about. <laughs> but, but I think there's a good example here, right? And like my thing about security is one thing that is almost guaranteed is that security itself, the attacks never change. It's just the stacks that change mm -hmm. and they just get repeated in every stack. What's interesting about ML and what I've seen a lot of is obviously you've seen in the news, everyone's screaming about safety, right? Yes. About what's going on with AI and the safety of AI and the issues around AI and ML. And in fact, you know, I went to this big AI conference where they had no security people on the stage, but yet their topics and discussions were around safety security, like a lot of these kinds of things were being discussed at early, early stages. And we're so early in sort of this wave, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's encouraging to see. I do think there may be a little bit of extremeness on some angles, but hey, it's better than, than nothing, which it normally is, is but the focus scared. is on safety. I think AI in the current state of things kind of scared on the use of the inference that made and the, the kind of things that they discover without us giving input that has made us jump the gun and say, okay, how do we control these things that is seamlessly uncontrollable? I think there was a technology leap. They made everybody very careful, especially in Europe where privacy and safety is like paranoia, where certain countries have banned it completely and saying, let's look at it, how we can build it quickly before we replicate a horse that goes so fast that we're not going to be able to block it and we need to bolt on security yet again as another cycle. So let's try to do this cycle right. And without stopping it though, I think the challenge right now is like, how do you build safely without stopping something that is so powerful that is unstoppable now as a force, I guess. And I think, you know, who knows, right, where that goes, but I think your your point is a good one, which is, you know, like we don't know, but at least we see good effort, mm. right? Like we see effort around it. We see discussion around it. Although I do think there's, you know, same as when cloud first came around, I do think there's a lot of FUD that's kind of revolving <laughs> around some of it. However, it's great that the topic is a discussion. And to me, the difference between when cloud first came around all of the security safety concerns were being raised by CISOs, mm -hmm. but in ML, we're seeing safety concerns raised by the engineers. Mm -hmm. And this is a very big difference, right? Yeah. And so although there is some still a lot of FUD, I think that it is that change is a pretty drastic one. And so it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out in the next couple of years. So you really saw the change of culture or maybe an effort, maybe an impact. Let's try to be positive. Maybe an impact that all the talk about security is everybody's responsibility finally surfacing in this kind of discussion. Yeah, I just, you know, it's just encouraging to see that these are, you know, the people who are talking about safety, you know, there's the extreme of safety when people are saying, hey, is AI going to destroy the human race? That's not what I'm talking <laughs> about, right? I'm talking about on, you know, even just general when we think about safety and ethics and like these things, especially when it comes to ML and security, right? There's been a lot of discussion and topics from engineering leaders and from thought leaders in that space. And it's not coming from security people, quote unquote. Right. Like yeah. that's you, normally in cloud, when the cloud wave started, it was all security people saying, oh, my God, like, I don't know what's going on with this. We got to put a stop to it versus here. I feel like people are, are they're not saying let's put a stop to it, but they are saying, hey, these are concerns. How do we approach it? How do we tackle it? How do we um, even think about it in this sort of unknown land that we're in right now. So, and, th and it's not CISO standing up and doing it, not security people standing up and doing it. That's super encouraging. Oh, that's great. And 
in the opposite side, how can we use, like there is a lot of buzz around where AI is going to take cyber or a lot of application in cybersecurity. And we still haven't seen something raising my opinion, and I want to hear your opinion as well. It's because AI has always been baked in in a lot of stuff that we do. And maybe now we're just waiting for the next generation of AI for cybersecurity. Yeah, you know, there's, you know, I think there's, there's two, if I, I'm going to do like, a, I do high levels of abstraction. So at like at 10,000 feet, <laughs> you know, when I think about AI, and again, what I'm talking about, I want to be very specific. I'm talking about generative AI, right? Because yes. actually ML has been around for a long time, right? And it's, and it's been in a lot of products in various different forms. So I want to talk about sort of LLMs and generative AI specifically, at a very 10,000 foot level, there is two buckets, right? There's bucket one, which I think everybody immediately thinks of, which is how do we secure it, right? And what do we do about securing LLMs and this technology? And I think in the second bucket is how do we use it to solve more fundamental security problems, right? Like right. this is using, using this as a tool versus securing it as a thing, right? And I think there's these two, at 10,000 foot level, there's these sort of two areas. Buckets. Now, me personally, I'm very much in the second bucket, which is how do I use this technology in order to better solve existing security problems that we have, mm -hmm. right? Like that to me, because we have really fundamental security problems that need to be solved. And I think this gives us step functions and ability to go do that. But in the first bucket, this is the hot topic today, right? Everybody wants to talk about how do we secure uh, these generative AI things. And so I'm going to break that down to 5,000 feet and I'm going to break it in. So when I think of a CISO, a CISO really has to worry about this in three ways, right? They have to say, okay, I need to worry about third-party LLMs, right? Which is my employees are sending all their data to chat GPT right now. And how do I ensure my private data doesn't go to this third-party LLM, right? That is sort of a bucket that I paint. And then there's a second bucket, which is my company is producing an LLM as a service, right? Like my company is somehow enabling or enhancing their product with an LLM or some sort of generative AI product. How do I secure that, right? right. And then when you, when you think about that, these are problems as simple as, you know, how do you how do you do multi-tenancy in LLMs? <laughs> how do you secure the the dev pipeline or the ML pipeline uh, when you build or do these things? This is where when you look at all these like MITRE attack models in ML or others, they're all focused on this data model poisoning, you know, attacking the the pipeline. This is where this, hey, I my company is producing an LLM. How do I go and secure it? And then there's a third bucket, which is we are we have an internal llm for internal enterprise services right think about this like oh like i instead of having an intranet search i have an llm where my engineer can just question the llm about internal proprietary documents right and so these are the three things i think as a ciso when you think about your org you need to worry about what do i do about third party llms what do i do about my llms as a service and what do i do about my internal llm right? And how do I secure this? Now, the hot topic is third-party LLMs for sure, right? Um, what do we do? The world. Yeah, because it's happening now, right? Like yeah. people are sending this, <laughs> people are blocking it. Who there's, but I've got a lot of opinions on that, but I'll hold off on those for now. There's, you know, they're blocking these things. They're, they're saying this is a hot area. We got to figure this out. And then there's, my company is trying or figuring out how to produce an LLM. We actually, I, you know, I don't know how many actual companies have gone through and successfully deployed one yet, but every single company in the world has a team dedicated it, to it right now, and they are trying to figure it out. And CISOs are like, oh, how do I secure that SDLC? And then the third one, I don't think just exists yet because no one's really produced an actual product at which internally I can now go and take and deploy. And so I think that's still on the future table as to where that comes. But these are the areas I think as a CISO, we've got to go and figure out how to approach. And that's brilliant. But I've also seen David Messier that did a third or fourth aspect of like, 
how do we protect our own data from LLM? Like, can we put canary in our own data so that we can break LLM scraping our own data? Well, I mean, here's the thing, like how big it's of a, a worry is that? question, by the way. <laughs> yeah. How big of a worry is that? I, you know, because, you know, to me, it's like, this gets into sort of maybe the copyright licensing mm. kind of uh, uh, problems where, okay, did you put your data on the web publicly for anyone to consume? And is that your intent? And then therefore, are you now going to say, I don't want that data? to be indexed or searched because what's the difference between an LLM grabbing it versus Google grabbing it? Yeah. And right. why are you making a difference about it now? I, I guess there was the monetization aspect that now had, people have realized, oh, I can actually monetize that data for LLM. And I think that's been also the debate on like, okay, now because everybody's restricting access because they realize they could monetize the data, new generative AI will be maybe dumber than the people that had access to an, a tons amount of data. But anyway, yes. Uh, yeah. To, I to, think to that's, your a point, for, uh, that's a topic yeah. for an entire different podcast. <laughs> yeah. And because then, then it's going to get into new LLMs only feeding off older LLMs, which is not actual accurate, predictable human data, which makes it even worse. Yeah. And I, yeah, it gets and uh, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well. To your your point is basically like in in some future world, do we get to some state at where the human contributed content is so valuable that the internet just becomes a series of islands at which you know cannot be used and the data cannot be used for any commercial purposes without some sort of agreement in place. That is a that is a scary place, personally. You know, whether that will happen, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to make theories about it, but I would say I think that that's it's, it'll be a rough place to be, and I think that it'd be hard to get there. So we'll see, though. We'll see. We'll see what happens yeah. anyway. This has been a fantastic conversation, Caleb. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Unfortunately, we are almost at time. We have a tradition in the show, if you remember, that we want to leave, aside from the doom and gloom that we painted, uh, with a positive message on on cyber. So what would be your positive message? Uh, I think you sprinkle a, a series of positivity. What I like of the conversation with you is like, you always like to look at things in a positive way. Uh, but if you want to leave our audience with the last positive message, what would that be? Man, it's a good question. I think I'll just repeat maybe the mantra that I've seen here is I do see some positive, right? I see a positive in uh, the growth and knowledge of the cybersecurity community and talent. I, talent is always hard and everyone says it's very difficult to hire. That's true. That will always be true. But I think that is growing tremendously. There's so many new people coming into this industry, growing their knowledge. I see a lot of engineers coming into this base, growing their knowledge. Uh, and so I think the positive part about this is, you know, we're seeing a lot of growth of really, really smart talent coming into this market. I hope our jobs, and obviously you're doing this with the podcast, is continuing to educate and grow them. Uh, I think that's a positive thing. And I think we are we are seeing effects of that. And we're seeing effects of that, like in my, you know, sort of ML AI comment, like you're seeing good people, engineers who are not security people really focus on safety. I think that's important. Brilliant. I, I love that last bit. And I love the positive message. I think it resonates with me. And I would add as well, mentorship uh, from cyber to non-cyber people helps bringing people to actually cut down their talent shortage. But that's a whole other topic for another podcast. <laughs> we yeah. have a list. But if people want to find more about you, uh, what you're writing, what's what's upcoming from you, uh, where they can find you? Follow me on LinkedIn. All right. Brilliant. Any other blog, any other thing coming or... I've got a blog, but LinkedIn, I think, is the best way. I'll post anything I post to my blog. You can Google my blog, but just find me on LinkedIn and follow me. I always do posts there. And if I do a post on my blog, I will always post on LinkedIn to point to it. So, but, you know, LinkedIn is my only social network. And so if you want to hear, see what I'm doing or even message me or chat with me, LinkedIn is the right way to do it. Brilliant. And the link to Caleb LinkedIn will be in the show notes. 
Caleb, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been, as always, a fantastic conversation, full of insight and full of positivity. That's one of the things that I like about our chat. Thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you. Cheers. And everybody, stay safe out there. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcast and post it on social media tagging Cybersecurity Cloud Podcast for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Discover other episodes at www.cybersecuritypodcast.com. 